to both lectures, please. I'd like to ask. Uh, I'd like to ask both speakers if they are aware of any academic research that is being conducted into the unique phenomena of, of Hebrew as one of the few remaining Aboriginal languages for Aboriginal people that have survived from the biblical period through the start of nation period at a time when other uh, languages of that period such as the Ara Arama Ara Ara Aramaic and, uh, and, and all the others of that period have, have more or less sort of nearly completely uh, uh, vanished. Would you like to answer? Or well, yes, I think in fact there are, I mean, if, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if I understood you correctly, this is just about the continuity of languages across centuries and millennia. And I think there are quite a few of them if you look at... Uh, Why do we not hear if, if, if you, for instance, look at, at Chinese, that goes back to, well, let's say, 1000, 1500 BC up to now, and of course, we, this is one of the things we do, we analyze the changes, of, or we can analyze the diachronic changes of, that happened in these languages during that period in, 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 uh, in I mean, in Indian languages we have this. So there are, there are quite a number of languages. You just uh, stipulated that I am referring to, the, to a language in the Middle East. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the languages of this, of this particular area. There are more speakers of uh, Chinese than speakers of Hebrew. Iran, you want to? I could say that Aramaic is the same thing. Ar Aramaic is actually better because Aramaic, Aramaic is actually uh, even better than Hebrew because it's spoken, you know, continuously for three thousand years. <laughs> Sorry, but you know. <laughs> Other questions or remarks, please. example that you gave something like uh, that the man put it was in the pot or something like that, right? And I was um, I was wondering uh, if perhaps a more appropriate translation would be like where the man put it was in the pot. And the, the, the question I'm asking is uh, this term nominalization it seems to me is used both for um, uh, propositional type nominalizations and uh, participant type normalization. So, uh, you know, who put it in the pot would be a participant type normalization, or where he put it would be a kind of locative participant normalization, and that he put it would be a proposition type normalization. And my question is how these relate to each other. It's, it's a real question. And if the term normalization, I'm, I'm often confused. And, and your, your talk uh, was extremely interesting, but it didn't resolve that confusion. Uh, no, it didn't. So it this didn't. for you, Walter. Yes, it did in so-called unphrase. And then the nominalized form tells you whether what you find in that unphrase is agent, patient, instrumental, and so on. You name it. And I think there is a certain parallelism also in Egyptian, and I think Polotsky was aware of it because in his in initial presentation of this uh, future uh, relative form, he made a distinction between, uh, between uh, relative clauses with uh, patient co-reference and indirect co-reference. And, and, and he said that one form was only used with indirect co-reference and the other one with direct co-reference in the relative clause. So I think that there is a certain overlap there again, but I didn't get it. I, I was not quite able to, to see how far that went. And probably 
languages may differ. You have one prototype, well, let, let's say the Tagalog prototype with this Ausrichtung suffix on the one hand, and you have uh, the, the other one uh, which you mentioned. The how did you call the other one? The, the participant type no. and the prepositional type. And, the, and I'm not so sure to what extent it, you can always, you can always make, uh, distinguish them. If I look at the examples I've seen so far, I have the impression that the examples in Egyptians, that, that there is a certain break. Um, up to one stage you have participant types, but then you also have propositional types, and they are not clearly distinguished. In, or, well, they are clearly distinguished in the language, but they are not as developed as, in, as, as you see it in, in Tagalog and other languages. That, as I said, in, in linguistic reality, you would probably have a whole continuum leading from participant types to propositional types and vice versa, and it would be possible to situate individual languages in that framework. And probably the examples I've seen on, so far make me think that Egyptian is somewhere rather in the propositional framework, but there are reminiscences of of this other particip participant type. Thank you. Other questions or remarks? Please. Me? Uh, uh, because uh, two uh, professors uh, both mentioned Chinese language, and I'm the only Chinese here, so I want to say something about Chinese. <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, uh, firstly, I, I feel very interested uh, in uh, your analysis of uh, 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 Chinese clause compiling. Uh, uh, many linguists believe that Chinese languages are uh, very typical uh, topic comment uh, language. So, uh, and uh, I think uh, most uh, of the topics in Chinese language are unmarked, uh, especially in modern Chinese language. The only feature for the topic is that it is uh, here put before the comment. So I don't know whether the, the, the Coptic language is also like this, because I did study Coptic language. Uh, so I just want to say that that's uh, a main feature of Chinese language. Well, this, of course, Chinese is one of the topic prominent languages, but the, what the interesting thing is, and I didn't say that in my presentation, if you look at modern Chinese, that clefting part is no longer as present as it was in ancient Chinese. Of course, today you have the Chida construction, which imitates uh, these structures up to a certain extent, so there is a certain diachronic <coughs> continuity. But the old forms, as you find them in classical Chinese, with these cleftings, have definitely gone lost. So what, you, what was clearly marked as a subordinate clause, as a dependent clause, for instance, by, with marking the genitive, with the subject in the genitive case, is clearly no longer present in Huachitada uh, Lai, <laughs> or something like that would be completely out. I know his coming. In, in, in modern in, in modern Chinese would be completely out, but that was the way to put it in classical Chinese. And I think what must have happened is somehow parallel but not similar to to to, to Coptic. So what used to be non-finite at one stage lost that distinction and was reanalyzed as finite. So loss of genitive for the subject and so on has gotten lost in the course, in the diachronic course of development of the, of the language. And I think that is just an interesting diachronic process to which there may be some superficial similarities which we can observe in... in, in, in uh, Please, in topic. you have a question. No, 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 but I go after. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's not a real question, but also not a real remark. It is just uh, that I was always struck by the by, by the by the difference of this of this kind of construction, this informative, this information uh, structure construction, Egyptian through the 
to the diatonia. Uh, the point is that you have always uh, a, devo a devoted construction <coughs> to frame uh, this type of information structure, but uh, there's a, a really a rapid, a rapid change between the different constructions, the different devoted constructions through the ages, and this is something that, uh, that has always been striking me, and I think to understand the diachronical, what, what, what goes on in the diachrony would tell us something about the, uh, the syntactic status of the, of the synchronic uh, uh, constructions. But yeah, this is... Well, I, I just took a, a pen this, and I, I worked on this a bit, and you see, you see clearly that in Egyptian, uh, as Martin says, you have consistently over these 4,000 years going from participant oriented to um, to proposition oriented, let's say nominalizations, and of course the end result being that they lose some of their information structural properties. I mean, maybe not to the extent that you find in some African languages whose verbal morphology you can reconstruct to old clefts. I think in Coptic you never get to this point where this becomes the unmarked construction, but you do get it in, uh, let's say, non focalizing constructions at the end of the of the story. So, Colette, please. Well, I lost half of the content of what I was going to say because they just mentioned it. But I wanted to point out that in Walter's uh, talk, he was playing around with contemporary oral languages very recently described. So with no uh, written tradition. And I don't know whether people write down what they say. In French, we don't write down what we say. So always keep track of the difference between what, pe what the language is alive versus the version that remains because it's written. But anyway, in his talk, he has already introduced a number of those languages I want to talk about of, on which we do field work today. And so we are doing a mental gymnastics of comparing um, the transcription, just transcription, of what people are talking today with no written tradition and set grammars that tell you you should do your you know, subjunctive the way you're supposed to, you know, with these ancient writings, and we don't know how what they represent, or I don't know enough about. Um, but there, in the ancient writing, we have all the history, we have all that depth, so I was very pleased that he mentioned Tom Givon. And if we, since I'm sitting here, Tom Givon is, was my colleague in Oregon. He was born here, raised here. And I love hearing his name here in Jerusalem <laughs> today. But he is the linguist, this non-generativist linguist that will never be. Don't pass that on the internet. <laughs> that will never be invited here in the Department of Linguistics because we are non-generativists, but I think he's right. Um, Givon says when you study a language at a particular moment in time, you do a description of the contemporary language, but your description must show like an x-ray of where those things come from. And he talks about carcasses of old construction in a modern, you know, in contemporary um, language. And I liked Walter talking about the path of grammaticalization that you find. So the construction are not always on the same <coughs> level of evolution. There are old things in modern language and new things in the coming. So when we do description, we should always keep track of those <coughs> dynamics. What's interesting to me with Egyptian is that we have such a record over such a long time that it would be an incredible laboratory of tracking grammaticalization. We did that a little bit with the classifiers. Thank you all. Time for lunch. You can continue to speak during lunch. Thank you very much, Walter and Eva.